We've also recently detected uh, a signal, uh, a radio signal from a galaxy that they've described as a flashing pattern. It's flashing in a pattern similar to a heartbeat. Now, first of all, can you, for our viewers, just explain, if you can, what exactly that means and how significant is that? Well, um, our best theory is when, when a star uh, starts to use up all of the fuel that's in it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and then <laughs> collapses in on itself. And when it does that, it's sort of like a figure skater that has been turning at a certain speed. And as soon as the figure skater pulls their arms in, they suddenly spin way faster. And you, you've probably seen it at the Olympics. That happens to stars. And when they get spun in like that, suddenly you have this a very active old remnant spinning incredibly quickly, and you see the pulses of energy coming from it. And so it, it's as if uh, a figure skater was yelling, and every time their voice came around, you could hear their voice. Some of them spin fairly slow and some incredibly fast. We call them, you know, pulsars or, or magnetars, and that's probably what we're hearing out there. But it's also just kind of a little bit weird to hear something from the darkness of space that is, you know, the same sort of rhythm as your own heart. It, it makes you, you know, just think there's got to be life out there. Well, I was going to say, that I have a theory, I reckon, you know, maybe there is life out there. I mean, yeah. if there's other planets with, with, with water on it. Do you think it's possible, especially seeing as Elon wants to go to Mars, you know, is it possible in the, you know, not too distant future in a galaxy not so far away that there might actually be life out there? Um, well, one of the things we've learned with Hubble and now we're learning with the James Webb is just how many planets there are. And right now there are at least, at least a septillion planets. I think that's a one and then like 24 zeros. Oh. Wow. So if there's if there's an, almost an infinite number of planets, kind of arrogant to think we're the <laughs> only ones. Right. It's not all that we yeah, are. Yeah, it's just so amazing. Yeah, it's and, oh. Chris, can we talk about your latest book, though? Because you are a best-selling author and you've written about all your life experiences, spent so much time up in space. It's fascinating. Everybody wants to know about it. But your latest book is a thriller. So you're mixing some fiction in there as well as your life experiences. What made you want to go down that route this time? It's another way to, to help people understand what it's like to fly in space. Writing a, a factual book is good, but when you can write fiction, you can get how everybody reacts and, and what, you know, how, it, how individuals might find this experience and some of the amazing stuff get hap that can happen. And so I wrote uh, an alternative history fiction, thriller fiction. It's already up for a couple international awards and it's being made into an eight part TV series. There it is now, The Apollo Murders. Apollo. I'm, I'm really Really thrilled with, and it's already in 14 languages, I think. But it's this woven plot in amongst a lot of stuff that really happened of what just might have happened on the way to the moon and back. Wow. Amazing. Now, uh, Chris, you've had an absolutely incredible career, a career that most people can only dream of. And, and, and most people that do want to become astronauts never do become astronauts. In fact, you know, you're one of the very small few humans on this planet that's going to have that experience. When you were growing up, talking about going to space to be an astronaut, were your parents kind of like, you know, taking all that with a pinch of salt or were they really <laughs> believing you and driving you? What was that like? Well, I think it's, it's delightful as a parent to hear your kids talking about their dreams. You know, and and often it's, you know, I want to be super woman or I, you know, I want to be whatever. But without those dreams, uh, I mean, your life gets pretty hemmed in. And I think it's important through your whole life to have some pretty wild dreams of what you might be able to do. But I didn't broadcast them to everybody when I was a kid. I sort of kept it to myself and kind of worked on how, how I could change myself to start turning myself into an astronaut. But actually tomorrow, is the anniversary of the launch of the first people to walk on the moon, July 16th, wow. 1969. Mm. And, and that was what really linked it for me. It wasn't just dreams anymore. People were leaving Earth and walking on the moon. So if they could do it, why couldn't I? Lovely. It's incredible, yeah. And there's so many celebrities now. What do you make of the whole A-listers heading up into space? You know, it's become like a real cool thing, <laughs> hasn't it? <laughs> well, I I think, you know, that's fun to talk about. I think the real point is space flight is now so safe 
and so much more simplified that the cost has come way down so that we can have like GPS satellites and weather satellites and and internet from space with things like Starlink. And, and, and sometimes even like some famous person can buy a ticket and go, but that's just a tiny piece of it. The, the real story is that we can now have a whole earth uh, Earth orbit, even Earth moon commercial system like international travel on Earth, it's going to start getting more and more space related. So, yeah, it's fun to look at, you know, when somebody famous goes flying. But uh, meanwhile, there's enormous commerce happening, giving us capability back here on Earth by, by being able to get to space more cheaply than ever.